Okay. So, first, of course, I would like to thank the organizers for having me and for organizing this great workshop. And so, we already heard a lot of people speak about replacing DFT, but um, yeah, a lot of people are also still using it, so we still try to improve it. And we will, um, or will speak about developing exchange collation functions with neural networks. So I will start with a short introduction into cone charm density functional theory, just so everybody's on the same page. So we have, of course, the hohenberg cone theorems with the one-to-one -one correspondence between the ground state density and the external potential in a non-degenerate system. And, um, of course, if we minimize the energy in terms of the density, we arrive at this ground state density. Unfortunately, of course, we don't really know how to do this directly for an n-electron system, so we use an auxiliary, auxiliary non-interacting Kohn-Sham system and then solve the corresponding Kohn-Sham equations with a kinetic energy operator and, of course, the Kohn-Sham potential that has to be um, somehow chosen such that it reproduces the ground state density in the end of the um, self-consistent cycle. Now, of course, of the Kohn-Sham potential, we know everything beside this exchange collation potential, which has to be approximated and similar to the um, energy expression, where we just don't know the exchange collation energy. And so the essential question in DFT has always been, um, yeah, how can we find an accurate description of this energy and potential, which are, of course, connected through this functional derivative which makes it a little bit harder for machine learning because, of course, if we actually want to do any self-consistent calculation, um, this um, has to be conserved. So if we predict the potential, it actually has to be the functional derivative of the energy. So traditionally, we have um, Jacob's ladder. So a long time ago, where um, people were still living on the dark and inaccurate Hartree world, of course, then we got the local, local density approximations um, this was the first rung of the ladder that was built. And yeah, then um, here on this level, um, a lot of us solid state physicists are still living. Then we have other more non-local functionals that are more accurate, um, especially hybrids, but they also, um, of course, scale far, um, far worse for larger systems. And so we are quite limited in the size and number of systems that we can actually run. Now, the question is, of course, um, let's say for um, normal research, at least for me, it's very difficult to imagine a um, functional form where I actually incorporate, let's say, 20 points of the density and say, okay, this is actually the um, exchange collation energy. However, for machine, mo uh, machine learning methods, are of course, great at this. And so instead of continuing to build this ladder, we will try to develop a neural network elevator where we incorporate um, far more non-locality and hope that at some point this will lead us also to the heaven of chemical accuracy. And yeah, um, we are still um, very much at the beginning of this. And so we will um, just study toy systems um, and discuss two training approaches and um, of course some results and how non-local we should actually go. And um, of course, there's been some previous work um, on machine learning for density function theory. So the first exchange collation potential was actually a one-layer neural network in 1996. Um, however, there, um, the problem was always that the neural network was completely, or the potential, disconnected from the exchange collation energy, so you couldn't really do any self-consistent calculations. And yeah, then we had um, some work, of course, on kinetic energy functionals um, in order to do orbital-free DFT, um, but this is of course not what we want to do, although it would be great if you have a good orbital-free MDFT. Now, um, I would also like to mention that there's been some recent work that goes in the same direction as our research that you can also find on archive. So, how do we do it? Um, we take the density as the input for neural network, propagate forward to get some scalar output, which at the end is hopefully the exchange collation energy, and then we use the um, autograd functionality, so I mean all the modern neural network frameworks provide you with the possibility to calculate the derivative with res um, of any scalar function basically, um, automatically, and we use that to calculate um, 
the exchange collation um, potential just by propagating backwards until um, the input. So in this way, we can, um, in a simple way, get a physical exchange collation energy and potential together. And of course, we can't take the um, complete density as input. Um, now we could do an LDA, but of course, a ton of people already did normal LDAs and put a lot of thought into them, or GGAs. This could be what, I mean, would uh, for neural network correspond at some point to a GGA. But instead, we want to go, um, of course, a little bit more non-local. And in the end, what we will always have to do is take some part of the density, put it into our neural network, get some result, and then scan the system, um, and yeah, get a um, sum over the, let's say, local energies, even though they are quite non-local in comparison to, for example, an LDA. And yeah, then derive um, the whole sum in order to get our potentials. Now, um, of course, it's um, not easy to actually get data for the exchange collation energy and potential. So in order to check if this idea was actually viable, we started with 1D systems with two electrons, so really just toy systems. And then by inverting the cone charm systems, um, we can yeah, get the exchange collation energy and potential. So the um, systems we are used um, were with randomized external potentials, so up to three nuclei, and then randomized soft Coulomb parameters and positions and nuclear numbers. Okay, so let's look at some first, oh no, sorry. Um, of course, um, we don't just want to fit the exchange collation energy and potential, but we want to get good um, energies in self-consistent calculations. And so um, it turned out um, that in order to do that, it was better to not only include the energy and the potential, but also the um, gradient of the potential uh, numerically calculated. And then for some neural networks, it was also advantageous to include um, this integral over the potential and then the, yeah, the difference with the exchange collation energy. I think this basically worked because then we would allow for some cancellation of errors that you wouldn't notice in the self-consistent calculation. Okay, so yeah, now let's look at some first results. So this is just some simple training curve. Here we have the number of epochs and here some um, mean squared error for the potential and as we would expect um, with an increasing non-locality. So this is the number of density points that we put into our neural network. We can get better results, although we also see that at some point we have um, diminishing returns. So the total system size in these cases were um, 200. Of course, um, um, so with a yeah, kernel size to so input size of the neural network of 180 didn't really help any further. Now, um, for self-consistent calculations, this was um, a little bit different. So we have here, um, so here the ground truth was, of course, the exact calculations. And we um, now compare the, say, um, mean absolute error in comparison to LDA. So in 1D, we only had a LDA available. And as we can see, even um, if we make our own LDA, it will be quite a lot better. And this is most likely because we're not actually trying to reproduce the correct um, exchange collation energy for a certain um, density, like a normal LDA does, but basically just the um, yeah, total energy of the system, or total exchange collation energy of the system. And then I think a little bit of um, overfitting might also have been involved. And now if we go um, up in kernel size, I mean, we can see clear improvements up to a certain point. And I think here, um, once it probably could have been still a little bit better by spending more time on training. But the problem is, of course, if we take um, more input points, we get a far bigger neural network because um, we need more parameters to take care of all the different density points that we use, which means that it's harder to train and we need more training data. So also for real systems, we basically um, need some yeah, good stopping point. And we think that um, like really long range interaction like van der Waals or electrostatic should still be handled in a different way anyway. And so if we can actually get an input on the order of a bond length or something, 
this should be completely um, sufficient. So some further um, results. Here we basically have the um, dissociation curve of the 1D equivalent of an H2 molecule. And of course, we can see that the um, LDA um, fails completely in the limit. So all curves are shifted um, so that the equilibrium energy is um, in the same point. And then we see, okay, here, um, this was probably well represented in the training sets and um, also really local effects. So all the machine learning um, more or less works. Um, but then here we read, uh, really need some non-locality. So 15 input points is not really sufficient for the end. But then with 30, we can already see some quite nice results. Although we um, can expect that this will still um, somewhat diverge because, of course, at some um, point, um, yeah, the non-locality of this will still not be enough. Now, of course, um, there are some problems with this. So it's not really easy to invert a cone charm system um, for real systems. Um, we also don't have a code um, for um, real 3D systems any, uh, at the moment. So if anybody has one and wants to collab uh, collaborate, please tell, uh, tell me. But anyway, um, there's another way how we can train that doesn't require um, these um, inversions. So what we can do is um, we can just take the neural network, same principle as before, get some potential and some energy out, and then we use this potential to solve the Kuhn-Sham system that we can now write the Hamiltonian. We get out a new um, total energy, so the eigenvalues, um, plus um, the energy minus these integrals and the Hartree energy. And then we also get out a new density. And of course, um, now we can put this new uh, density and the total energy into the loss function. And then we do the back propagation through this whole process and still get the yeah, derivatives with respect to our weights and can optimize them. So in this way, um, yeah, no inversion is needed. However, um, it is far more challenging to train. So, of course, um, this process um, takes longer because we, I mean, of course, we have a bigger computational graph. And then the um, solution of the Kuhn-Sham system takes some time. It's also not really optimally implemented in um, some uh, machine learning frameworks. And yeah, there are some um, further, let's say, even more te technical problems. OK. So to summarize, um, first, um, just a very general point that um, maybe everybody can remember that um, we can generally very well trial functions, train functions, and the derivatives at the same time with neural networks. I mean, this is already done for force fields where we have the energies and the forces, but can probably be done for quite a lot more um, functions. And then, yeah, by going strongly non-local in this way, we can get um, far better exchange correlation functionals, and um, while um, still having the same scaling with system size, um, let's say like um, traditional functionals. And yeah, then of course for the future we want to go to um, 3D functionals for molecules as well as solids. And yeah, then hopefully at some point we arrive um, with this elevator somewhere and there will be some sign outside that says heaven of chemical accuracy. Although there's probably still a little bit of. Okay, thank you for your attention. Could you uh, tell what's the what's the reference against which you are training? Uh, is it some this exact? Basically, if you have two electrons and um, in one D, you can get some exact results. Okay, so for hydrogen, you did some uh, for the hydrogen molecule that you showed. Yeah, this was a so one D corresponding thing basically. So two nuclei with one electron that we um, pull further apart. Okay, so in the future, if you want to do it, let's say for real systems, uh, not yeah. toy systems, then you will have to have. You mean to say you will have some really uh, non-local, highly accurate functional, and against that, you want to train the. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, for molecules, um, it's quite obvious that we would like some CC. CCSD or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. M calculation that we would like to train against. And I mean, for solids, everything becomes a little bit more complicated. And of course, I mean, 
there are some quantum Monte Carlo calculations, of course. For, for example, we need constant densities. We need good values for that for solids, and then we have to um, see, basically. But, I mean, the um, next step will definitely be um, some simple systems in 3D, and yeah, we will see. Can you also comment how you represent a density, just a grid? Yeah, so um, in 1D, a grid is um, just simple, and we could build the um, symmetry into the neural network. Um, of course, in 3D, we will choose some basis function representation. Thanks for this talk. Um, as, uh, as you said, if you want to look for, for, uh, for a larger system, you will, you will always need the true density to run. If you want to, to get from the neural net the true exchange correlation functional. So have you thought about maybe having something different than the density, to something that, we, uh, that could be accessible by experiment, for instance, as input data, and then uh, because the density will always be a problem. If you need the density as input data, you won't. We will never get the true, uh, the, the true functional because you will need the true density, and you will never be able to have that because you will need, like he said, uh, very very accurate DFT calculations, and we don't have that for yeah, our system. What we are doing, and um, we still want to do um, self-consistent calculations with these functionals. So, of course, we will, will, won't arrive at a perfect functional anyway, but um, let's say um, I would be extremely happy if we could, um, in this way, get a function, let's say, with the accuracy of hybrids. If we could get that, then we could do hybrids, and um, that basically have a similar, I mean, they will be slightly slower than, for example, GGAs, but they will have the same scaling with, with size, and that, I think, would be pretty good. So, the last, the, the self-consistent, uh, yeah. Workflow. It, it's just like a DFT calculation, ex except that on top of that, you're putting a neural net to calculate the exchange correlation. Basically, yeah. So this okay. um, is just one, st um, let's say, one step of self-consistent calculation. And the point is um, that um, we then put these two results into our loss function and do the um, derivatives um, for the weights um, through this whole process um, in order to update them, basically. Um, we can also add more steps here, so we could, um, for example, now use this new density again as the input for the neural network, and then calculate our loss function with these eigenvalues and these exchange collation energy and potential from this density. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's not quite clear to me already yet um, where's the best point to stop. But I mean, of course, this is the computationally and most efficient one and should provide um, the sufficient information for the neural network to train. Maybe a quick question. Yeah. Do we really need density? You know, there are so many successful methods. You just predict energy, and, and it's much better. So, I mean, of course, if you, I mean. Why bother? <laughs> OK. I mean, if you can just get a method that directly predicts you um, the energy and you don't need DFT anymore, that's awesome. Basically, I mean, <laughs> if we don't need DFT anymore, um, I mean, that's um, great, but yeah, I, s I think, um, I don't know, maybe everybody who uses DFT here regularly could maybe raise their hand. Yeah, so I think at the moment we are still at a level um, where it would be, I mean, where it's really beneficial still if we can improve DFT. Of course, if we, as at some point, um, we don't need DFT anymore, then this is also not relevant anymore, yeah. Okay, let's take our speaker.